I suppose now you'll, I just need to explain, well, what, what limited authority like do I have? Um, so when I'm, say, checking out a source on pipes or bagpiping and like I'm listening to somebody like talk, especially YouTube or whatever, doing a talk on bagpipes, well, I kind of like to know a little bit of background about that person. I like, I want to know, well, you know, how did they come to this stage? You know, how, how, what is their experience of the instrument or their interest in it or what their kind of background is? It doesn't have to be an academic background. Like, I don't mind what type of a background they have, but I just, I'm, I'm interested into, into, you know, how, how, like what they're doing or, or how they came to the thing. Um, you know, as I say, it's not that there has to be a criteria. Like, it's not like, I believe, you know, it's not an academic thing. I don't think that you have to go to college or have to study it academically or, you know, be the most literate person. Like, I mean, but I, yeah, I just like to know who's, who's talking and what kind of little bit about them, whatever. So just, just about me, like how I came to pipe, pipes and piping and starting off and, um, all right, I, um, neither of my parents played music. Right, but they sang. Both of them sang, and now they didn't sing professionally; they just sang casually. And so you'd hear singing all the time at home, um, all kinds of songs, uh, all sorts of songs. Uh, but Irish songs were always in there. I would say probably was an hour, a quarter of all the songs you'd hear in my house would have been Irish. Like there was a good you know, quarter to a tour of the songs would have been Irish. Uh, songs uh, in English. Both my parents spoke English so now I learned Irish um, later on I learned well we all learn it in school then we go up to a level but I don't know there's something wrong with the way we learn Irish in school. All of us get it all of us have to, uh, have to learn Irish in school right from the time we we start school at about four years of age and we leave our secondary ed education at about 17 or 18. And then if you want to go on to third level college, that's up to you. But um, so we spend 14 years of our lives in the educational system and we come out of school speaking better French and better German than we do Irish. That's generally it. Um, it's so badly taught. Now they are changing it, but uh, so I, I took it on board myself to learn Irish. Uh, kind of when I was about 17, 18, I, I wanted to learn it seriously. So... All the travel time I had and free time I had, I spent in Irish speaking areas and I spent every God given moment like listening to Irish radio programs and documentaries in the Irish language. And I just put years of it just trying to create a, a world of just listening to Gaelic so it'll sink in. So, luckily for me, it did. So, I can speak fairly fluently I'd say I'm about 90% 90% fluent in Irish there's that 10% that I'm lost on that like I can understand it when I hear it and I, I can understand I'd say I can understand about 95% of it there'll always be that bit that I don't get but when I go to speak it like I can't speak like like I'd like to speak it as I say I can speak about uh, maybe I'm lying maybe about 80% 85% of it I'd have the vocabulary but there is that elusiveness, there's words that I'd like to know that I just cannot think of in the Irish language. And I would say I have the Irish of a, of a, I don't know, a 12 year old. The vocabulary of a 12 year old. That's the way I would put it if I was, yeah, 12 year old. Um, but my grandmother did speak Irish. Uh, when she came, one of my grandmothers, when she first came to Dublin, um, she used to, I was told by my aunties that she used to like count in Irish when she was doing her messages, her shopping. And she'd sort of think of things in Irish. She'd be thinking and counting in Irish and she had a few phrases and that. So, now I know that the Irish language clung on in, like she came from County Cavan and actually in the 19, up till the 1940s there were still Irish speakers in County Cavan, believe it or not. So, whether... There was remnants of it in her locality or whether it was the education she received at school, she might have learned it that way, but it's the kind of, I mean, Annie had a bit of Irish, but anyway, so 
my parents didn't. They spoke English. Uh, they did a bit of school Irish. My mother wasn't too bad. But my dad left school at 11. So he even he didn't even have much of an education. So, um, yeah, but so it was English language. But anyway, they sang and they sang a lot. And once, like, I even remember it, like, which was lovely. Like, and I, look, I'm only 41 and the pubs, the pubs in, 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 no matter where you went in Ireland, like you, you could, in many, many of the pubs, not all pubs, and I'm not going to paint that, this sort of a false picture, but in lots of the pubs that you'd go to, like they, they, you'd get a good sing-along going, you know, a sing-song, and uh, you get everything from sort of Dean Martin to, you know, the Dubliners, the Wolf Towns, the... Ah, uh, the Clancy's, um, you know, even Count John McCormick sort of stuff. Like you'd get anything. You'd get, you know, you'd you'd get all sorts of songs at a sing song, and someone would be known for singing certain kinds of songs, and you know, so you'd have like, you know, it'd change. So it it was nice. It was an open kind of a thing. Like you know, or some person might only might always sing the same two or three songs, but they were very good at that kind of thing, and. Um, so you'd get sing songs going and I suppose that's when I started becoming exposed to Irish well I was kind of grew up with it I suppose you'd hear songs all the time if they weren't played on you know records and later on cassettes and CDs like playing obviously to my parents singing to you go to the pub you'd hear it and yeah it was around so I was drawn to the Beuron first of all, so when I was about 12, 11 or 12 I got a Beuron and uh, started learning that. Then I went down to Caltus Caltari Ireland in Monkstown, it's the capital of Caltus Caltari Ireland in the world, it's the headquarters. And I learned the Beuron down there and very very quickly since, yeah, since I was about 12, 13, sort of age 14. Over that time, like I kind of I became accustomed to seeing Ellen Pipers and hearing Ellen Pipers, and I was just so drawn to the pipes, uh, Ellen Pipes at that time. Although I always liked bagpipes as well, I always liked the, the idea of like the kilts and and the marching bands and the drums and all. I loved that. I always did. Um, in fact, my first ever br real kind of brush with music was there was one St. Patrick's Day uh, a parade. So I'm not sure whether it was done Leary or Bray at the time. This is where I'm from. So if if you if you're not familiar with my accent, there you're trying to put where I am from in Ireland. It's the south of County Dublin and the north of County Wicklow. So I've grown up there and I still live here and everything else, but. Yeah, like so there was a St. Patrick's Day parade on and I was only a toddler, like I think I was two or three and I broke away like from my mummy and daddy. I heard this 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 pipe the, the pipe band coming up the street on the uh, on the parade and I broke away from them like real quickly and I ran into the middle of the, the ranks of the the pipe band and like I was marching with them and you know, I thought you know I I thought I was one of them, like I suppose in my own little way I was one of them or I was gonna be one of them in the future. But just at the little time that I was there, like I was that was it. And you now my mother, like they, <laughs> everyone thought it was funny or whatever, cute, like and my mother and father were probably a bit embarrassed, like trying to get me back out of the band. Like you're knock she was like, knocking into the pipers and drummers started trying to get the child out of the out of the way. But uh just before she did, she took a photograph of me, so, marching with the pipe band down the street, so, it, it's like, just walking with them, so I think, yeah, from a really, really early age, I was drawn to pipes. Um, but then, yeah, um, when I was about 12 or 13, I started playing the bell on, and going down to Coltis and Monkstown, as I say, there was, on a Friday night, like, the bell ran, the, all the different lessons would be on on the Friday night, all the beginners, so there was like tin whistles, there was pipes, fiddles, harps, bell runs, everything, and um, what was lovely about that session was after the, after that, the, the lessons, 
the musicians, like the good musicians, and even the learners, like it, it, they, they, they'd, they'd form. Like at one time, like there was like tr three sessions in the one place. Like there was, there were several rooms in it, and there was sort of one, one uh, as you walk in at the fireplace at the near the main door. Then there'd be another session in the in in the next room in at the bar. Um, then there'd be another one out at the out at the back room near the dance hall. Sometimes it, there'd even be another smaller one upstairs for the for people who are just trying to practice the tunes that they were learning together. So you could have like three, four even sessions in the same place. And that was on a Friday night. This was in the nineteen nineties. I'm talking about now. And um, yeah, just what what an amazing array of musicians and. All sorts of like you know, from beginners to like professional, like lifelong musicians that you know, and there was a great respect there, and I'm sure there still is. Just I haven't been down there for years. Um, the learners that sort of sit on the outside of the, of a session, kind of, and you know, you'd be you'd be barely sort of tapping away. Just you know, you were kind of kind of tolerated, like if you sort of stayed on the outside um, and kind of kept a low sort of a profile and just you know if you're like learning the tin whistle like you'd be barely blowing it kind of thing and you know if you're learning the bell on you'd be barely tapping it and you're getting familiar with the tunes and the beats and everything else and as you became better they'd encourage you sort of more and more into this sort of inner circle and then uh, you know obviously the better you got the more confidence you gained as well you know you took part much more fully and completely in the music and um, so it was a nice it, there was great sort of transitions and even those sessions i was telling you about those like say three sessions in the one place like some of them would be more so for beginners like that practice and all going over the tunes that they'd learned in the lessons and then there was another service that you know a middle of the road one you know kind of in between Kind of, you're still a learner, but you're a little bit better, and you're kind of you're a bit more confident. But then there was another session where it was just kind of like the cream of the crop were playing at that, and you know it was just fascinating to. So for me, like I was always then drawn towards Ilan pipers. There was something about Ilan pipes, like the piper kind of. I don't know, like he started the king of the ring. You know, he started the, the piper like. It's not that he was always like the natural leader, but there was a certain reverence sort of given towards, like the piper was kind of at the centre of, you know, he was, and he was to me. You now maybe that was just in my mind that it looked like he was flanked by the other musicians, that he kind of held centre stage, and the other musicians kind of looked towards him or followed his lead kind of thing. Now what that wasn't always the case. Like some, you know, I'm just. It, it's not like I, there was a definite sort of seating arrangement or anything like that. But in my mind, sometimes I'd look at that and that's the way I would see it. Um, just a general sort of respect um, for the instrument. Um, they hold that in Irish music. The pipes and the harp are the two kind of... Like, like I don't want to detract from the harp at all. Like The harp has a whole amazing history of its own that I, I don't know half as much about um, but some of it is connected with some of the harp music is connected with with, with bagpipe um, music sort of especially like going like if we're going back to kind of the Gaelic age you know kind of the golden age of sort of the, the, the Gaelic times like there was you know pipers and harpers and uh, even into like the 1500s and the 1600s and kind of you know they were they tried to save these things in the 1700s um that harp festival that was held up at belfast oh, i forget your man's name that um that organized that he's but there was pipers went to that as well um and th th it wasn't just harps but th the repertoire and that you know the the kind of they share a similar kind of a fate the two instruments um but look, I'm not here to talk about harps, but... So anyway, yeah, right, this is my experience of it. So, I was really drawn towards Ilan Pipes then. I, I, you know, every Friday night I was looking at Ilan Pipers and it was just something like just... So, but I didn't have much money when I was growing up. Um, and it was always sort of a very elusive thing to me. I just kind of thought, ah, oh, you know, that is amazing, but like, that'll never be me. Like, 
I don't know, like did, did I think I couldn't afford the instrument there? You know, when you're when you're when you're twelve or thirteen or fourteen years of age and you're told that this instrument like costs like five grand or six grand or something like that and you know like like I've, I thought I was lucky to have my bit of pocket money like to spend on my bus fare and I didn't drink then obviously not so like you know a few bottles of lemonade and a few packs of crisps and peanuts and my bus fare there and my, my bus fare home there was no way in my little mind that I could ever afford five grand or six grand or whatever grand like so the, the, I was always sort of in awe of them and I always kind of thought that, that you know will I ever get there but as I got older, I did start when I started working on that. I started saying, "Yeah, no, I, this is what I want." Like, and as it happened when I was, uh, I don't know, I was about fourteen or fifteen. Um, I came across a tin whistle. I don't know where I came across it, uh, and I started just playing it. And I, I wasn't bad on it actually. And so I'd gone down from a bell run, which I was fairly handy on. Like, I had good sense of rhythm, good sense of B, and. I was handy on it and I think a bell round was a great sort of introductory step into Irish music, you know, to, well, a very good teacher as well, Helen, and she always used to say, look, you're there to accompany those musicians, you know, you're there to help them with their beat, you know, you're not there to, to you're not there to lead them, like they're leading you, but you're helping them along the way. So she used to always say, which was a valuable lesson to me, she used to always say, watch their feet. Who's ever the leader of the tune? Who's ever kind of the lead instrument player? Watch their their foot tapping, and that's the tap that you maintain. Don't change it on them. Don't slow them down. Don't speed them up. You watch their foot and go off that and start off softly. And that was great advice for me because unfortunately, I think other bell round players, if you're listening and you play the bell round, that's what you should be doing. Don't just jump in there and start lashing out your own bee and expecting everyone to go to your rhythm. You're there to accompany the, mu the other musicians. There's nothing as bad as a bell round player doing that, changing the, the tempo and changing the pace of something. That, mu that, that whistle player or that fiddler or pipe or, or, or harp player, whatever you want, banjo, have taken the trouble to learn the, 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 the tune and they have their own beat and their own time and their own way of doing it. So. You're there to accompany them, not to lead them. But anyway, I got the tin whistle and um, naturally I just talked to it. Um, I was just, I just found I was like my fingers were walking up and down the holes. You know, I was able to figure out kind of baby tunes really quickly. Uh, you know, then I could figure out kind of simple Irish uh, songs. Uh, fairly quickly on the whistle and then um, I suppose I was then saw that as my way of going towards Dylan Pipes if you could if you could master a tin whistle it's a step towards the chanter so long story short I ended up getting um, a practice set of Dylan Pipes and then about two years later, I, I, I got my drones added, or three years later, I had the drones added, so then I had a half set, and I was getting lessons, but I just wasn't going anywhere with Ellen Pipes, I just, unfortunately, like, I was raging, like, but they were breaking my heart, I wasn't making any progress uh, at all with Ellen Pipes, um, I just, I don't know, I found them very taxing, very vexing, um, I real di I had real difficulty as well in learning to read the music. It was a real stumbling block for me. Um, so I'm practically I'm illiterate in reading music. Um, and it didn't help me. Like, you know, if my my tutor, I'd I'd mainly one or I'd one tutor for most of the time. But then there was an another lad that used to step in sometimes, and I thought he was better actually, but. Um, you know, if someone, if he starts going C, G, A and all that, me, like it didn't mean anything to me. Um, I couldn't associate it. I was grand gone by ear. Um, in the end, I figured out that's the way I learned by ear. Um, and then to see it written down, like to see that, 
the notes, the musical notations on the the way of those lines with the dots on it. I don't even know what that's called. I mean, like that just shows you. Like I don't know. I, I I'm totally ignorant and illiterate in music. That just used to wreck me head. Like that didn't help me at all. Like like you you were given the sheet music and then you were given your ABCs written above the things. So to me that was like learning two different things that I couldn't get my head around. Like didn't I wasn't translating that to my fingers. But luckily for me, as I say, of a good ear. And I knew from at home I was able to learn tunes on my tin whistle just from listening to them on CDs and tapes. And I'd play them back and play them back and play them again. And then I'd have it after a little while just from repeating what I'd heard. So it was grand that way. So luckily anyway, one of my teachers used to like, let me record the lesson. So I'd just listen and I'd record it over. And I'd go home and I'd practice that again and again. And I'd learn the tune that way. But I don't know what it was. I think I just think like with Ellen Pipes, they were just you know, to get them to sound beautiful like they did they are the most beautiful sounding instrument like in the world, but to to get them to sound beautiful. Cause other than that they sound dreadful. Like they sound awful, squeaky, squawky, that whole like strangling the back yard. So like you have a bag of cats and you're strangling a cat and all of that and like I wasn't really getting that beauty out of them, you know. And even after all the practice and even recording the lesson and trying to repeat it and I was just getting, I don't know, like, you know, maybe it was just my fault, like, but like, you were squeaking into the second octave when you didn't want to go into the second octave and then when you did want to go into the second octave but you wouldn't get there and, I mean, for those of you that don't play in pipes, they're playing, say, a Scottish bagpipe or a small pipe or a lowland pipe. Like, for lots of those notes, especially on the faster tunes, like, to, to, to hit that second octave, like, you have to squeeze the bag, like, you know, harder, like, for a fraction of a second, just, a fraction of a second, just to get that note, that high note. And then the next note will be in the lower octave. So then you, you, you like, you release the pressure off the bag again for a fraction of a second to bring it back down. And then maybe like three notes later, you have to hit the high octave again and then you squeeze it that little bit higher, like, like that harder to get that higher note again. And these are all just like fractions of seconds. And that balance, it's so fine. And to be honest, so it just it used to fuck me up. Like that's like, that's no other better, better way of putting it. Like I just and what used to happen me then with the Ellen pipes is I'd get more frustrated with them than anything. And I was always told that once the instrument starts to frustrate you, put put it down. Um, when you get tired or you get annoyed or you're not sort of satisfied with what you're doing, put it down. Take it back out tomorrow or whenever you do feel like. And unfortunately, I think for me, I I found myself putting them down more often than I'd want to take them up, you know, and it broke me heart, like, because, like, my parents, as I said, like, we didn't have much money in our house, and, you know, they, they saved, and they got lend, a lend, and, and everything to pay for them, and I felt, like, really obliged to, um, not, an, not in, in, in a strict sense, like, under an obligation, but I felt my own way that I really wanted to do it first of all and then second of all like I felt like I'd let them down if I didn't um, do it and now my, my parents weren't like that that was me they were just happy to see me playing um, or trying at least you know that I had an interest um, but I just I used, just used to get so so frustrated with them and I felt bad about being frustrated with them as well that I wasn't making much progress so what I'd always say to people was, you know, at the end of that, I think I was at them for about seven years and I only knew seven tunes. Um, and I wasn't really proud of myself. And so unfortunately, um, I, I put them down. And th then this is kind of sad, but it's it's relevant to my story. Um, 
when my dad died, like, I think, what was he, 53? And uh, I took him out once more to play them, uh, you know, at his funeral. And um, I tried to play the, there's a tune by the Fury Brothers called The Old Man. And uh, I, try, I, I, played, I tried to play that in the church. And I think I made a hames out of it. Like, I don't think I'd done a good job of it at all. Uh, I was a bit embarrassed. I think, you know, I hit a few bum notes or... It was squealing into the second octave when it shouldn't have been. And when I... When I did try to get to the second octave, I wouldn't play those high notes or didn't hold them or whatever. And I don't think I'd done the tune justice. And I don't think I'd done me da justice. And I don't even think I'd done the pipes justice. So... I kind of, I remember putting them away that day, just then, I know it was very emotional because it's my father's funeral and, like, he paid for them. Him and, my, you know, my mother did as well, the two of them, like, but my dad was with me, like, when they were, when they were being made and, um, you know, my dad was there and I collected them and all of that and then I felt I let him down, even on the funeral day, I felt bad. And, uh, I got, I got angry with them again and then I just, I, I, I Kind of decided there and then that that was it with me and Hill and Pipe and like I wasn't going to do it and I couldn't do it. So I put them back in the box and I put them under the bed and then they remained there. And now just before that I should say he did see me playing good tunes on good pipes because I should have maybe mentioned this first but I... When I would get, when I was getting disillusioned with Illum pipes and started starting to realise that maybe they're not the instrument for me, I thought I was for them, but maybe they weren't for me. I, st I was always, as I said, interested in bagpipes, like Scottish bagpipes or Great Highland bagpipes. And um, so I saw for sale, like the, there used to be a magazine called the Buy and Sell magazine, and. Uh, there was for sale this second hand set of a, of a set of bagpipes like out of a garage type of a sale and I just thought look what the hell I'll try those um, yeah you know I was at the as I say I was at the, the, the Ellen Pipes for about 7 years at this stage so by now I was about 18 years of age 18, 19 kind of age and I just thought I'd, I'd, I had been, I started my, my, my I was working in a job and I had a little bit of money and I could afford days, so yeah, the long, the long and the short of it was I bought a second hand set of Scottish bagpipes and oh, do you know what, I got on great with them. Yeah, um, within a few weeks of, of just practicing, now obviously right, they were a new instrument but I understood, what, I understood everything to do with them, like because because of me and pipes, so I knew a bit about reeds and reeds close up and they need to be opened up and there's soft reeds and hard reeds and I knew all of that. But obviously there was other things because now it's it's a mouth blown instrument. It's wet. It's gonna get wet. That has an effect on reeds. The bag. Um. So I needed a bit of guidance um, with them, but I was very enthusiastic because within a few weeks and months. Of picking up the Scottish bagpipes, I had all I'd, I'd learned on the Illum pipes for the previous few years. I transferred over very quickly, so I was back. You know, I was at a level where I'd left off, and then I was finding that the tunes I just found them all easier because there's only the one octave on a on a on a, on a, a Highland bagpipe. Just one octave. You've only got like the eight notes, so. If you're like me and you don't read music, it's like you've got like your do, re, mi, fa, so, and you just have one of them, and that's it. And so, yeah, sorry, I'm walking up a hill, that's one out of breath. Um, yeah, so I just found that the, 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 the Highland bagpipes are much easier to play than the Island pipes, and that was simply it. And I started to get on ground with them. Now, luckily for me, uh, there was a man not, not so far away um, called uh, Timmy Crimmins and that's sort of significant as well because his surname was Crimmins and as if you're in if you do know about pipe and Highland pipe and the, the McCrimmins were like one of the main sort of 
families of pipers uh, in Scotland um, for centuries. So this man's surname was Crimmins and uh, his niece was married to my cousin. So that's how we got in touch with him and he was very, very helpful. Um, I got a couple of lessons from him, a few tips, you know, what to do with reeds when they're getting wet and tips about sealing the bag. I had a leather bag. Like the first set, of, actually, as I found out in the end, the first set of pipes I had were actually just, you know, like those Pakistani sets. Now look, at my rule of thumb to you, if you're only thinking about getting into bagpiping and you're thinking about a Pakistani set, like, don't go there. Don't. Just don't. Um, most of my experience with Pakistani sets of pipes have been, has been bad, to say the least. Um, and you will get a second-hand set of Scottish-made bagpipes or whatever, American-made or you know, a decent set of Scottish pipes, you will get them second-hand for a much more affordable price. You might have to pay a bit extra, but it's worth it. Like, you know, you could look at, if you had 500 euro, right, that's what, like $600, $700, you'll get a second-hand set of Scottish pipes. You, you will, eventually, in the end, you will. So just keep looking. And don't go near the, the, those Pakistani sets. But anyway, luckily for me, this set, uh, what I had, well, I didn't know that at the time, but I lear learned in the end that they were a, a, a Pakistani set. Now, luckily for me, they worked. They actually weren't too bad at all. Now, when I think back on it, they weren't great. Like, the chanter was very low and soft. It wasn't all that loud. But then that suited me because I wasn't a hard blower. I was only learning how to blow the pipes. And I actually didn't want them to be all that loud either because the like the neighbours and, and everything and when you know the way like when you're learning something you don't want to be too loud learning it because you know that everyone else can hear you and you feel embarrassed so it suited me and it wasn't just that I, that that they were loud because of there was a soft reed it was even the bower and everything like the the chanter itself was a touch smaller than a, a regular chanter and the reeds were even kind of made to fit that chanter so and they were softer, so everything about this set of pipes was lower and softer, which did sort of suit me. But when I went over to Scotland for the first time, I heard up close, like and proper, like what bagpipes should sound like. And so what I actually started to do was I started to replace the Pakistani set with bits of, we'll say, like a real bagpipe, and. Um, Plus the bag was giving me terrible trouble as well. Like there was a leather bag on it, and it was just made of pig skin or something. It wasn't like she when I was sheepskin, a good sheepskin bag can last you for years. But this this thing, this bag that I had, it wasn't great. It was it used to often leak, and even you know, like you could season the bag, and I was told that okay, you could buy a bottle of pipe seasoning. But this was what, this was why I was lucky that there was I used to go to, as I said I went to Timmy Crimmins for a few pointers, and then there was another fella that lived uh, not so far, um, he used to play the bagpipes as well. If I could think of his name, Kenny. Um, yeah, the, yeah, Kenny. He was helpful to me as well. I used to call after him sometimes if I got stuck as well. Um, but between the two of them lads, like, and especially I think Timmy because he was older, they remembered he remembered like having leather bags and how to season them. So there was all kinds of like homemade kind of mixtures and remedy. Now you, you could buy the bottle. In the end, I found out there was a place. See, this was before the internet as well, so it was very hard to get your hands on things and communicating wasn't like nowhere you know you'd always either be told oh you have to go up to scot up the north or you have to go, go over to scotland when you need things like um but some of the things like the the seasoning was a bit mad like the, you know like there was one i was told like, like egg whites like you know egg whites and uh, um oil uh like as in cooking oil um then like lard like beef fat like dripping or you know or suet um honey was another one mixed in and 
but there was another one you know and the whole idea of this obviously was to seal the bag like to you know to stop it from cracking like from drying out and cracking but also as a water repellent as well but between all these natural things like you'd, you'd fats and oils you'd honey um then it was like melt beeswax into this solution and um basically like all the wasps used to go out like the wasps used to go after you wasps wasps and bees like would smell the the sweetness of the, the, the you know basically it's food basically you know and the flies and all of that like that was a nightmare that this you know the, these leather bags now I've, I've never played i've never played a, a sheepskin bag on a bagpipe um like I've so wet wet blown pipes like I mean I've got like leather bags now again because I'm playing I'm playing small pipes and border pipes but like they're they're dry they're fine but for the anyway the, the if you're thinking of taking up the the, the grey Highland bagpipes I would avoid leather bags like the synthetic bags are much better if if you get a nice firm stiff robust sy synthetic bag or better still the 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 two the combined like you can get like leather like it's le like it's leather but then on, on the back of the leather it's coated with this it's it's a synthetic thing and and, and leather kind of combination like they're fantastic because you do want a good s solid bag under your arm um, and you know good heavy stiff solid strong bag some of those synthetic bags can be a bit flimsy it's like having a, a fucking blown up like ryan mac on their arm or some sort of a, a rubbery balloon and that's what it, it like like look at this is my experience you, you can get these shit bags um but i find um that the banatoin bags are generally good that as a brand name banatoin and the ones with the zips as well so that you can just open them up and let them dry out or whatever or put in a bottle trap that's what i'm using at the moment it's fine it's solid it's i have it years there's no problem with it um the i think it's called semi-synthetic or something like that but um yeah so anyway that's how so i, I start getting into the bagpipe and more so then and i started uh as I say, when I went over to Scotland, like when I heard like full sets like of pipes, like pipers and pipe bands, and I really realised that what I had like didn't really sound much like what they had. So then I just sort of thought of well, what about if I just get a decent chanter? And so that works too. I'd so with the three Pakistani drones, which were sort of soft, and then I got a proper like poly chanter, whatever plastic, you know, um. There was a shop I always shopped in in Edinburgh called Bagpipes Galore and he was always so so helpful that man and he still is I've still bought things off him now on the internet um, but uh, he'd give you the same attention if you were buying like a five pound raid or a five hundred pound like like no matter he'd give you the same attention you know and whether you're a complete novice and a beginner like me or you're at a half your life, he'd give you the same attention. So, like, I'm just giving a little a little plug to his shop. But they're called Bagpipes Galore. They're on the end of the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, and he helped me a lot. So, he sold me a, a decent uh, chanter um, at a decent price, and soft reeds to get me started, uh, chanter reeds, and, and then a few synthetic drone reeds as well to just stick into the Pakistani drones. And yeah, it worked like so. Now, so then, had a decent sound the chanter, soft drones. But as I say, I was using the soft uh, chanter reed that worked. Um, eventually, then I replaced the bag, so I used the synthetic bag. And eventually, obviously, then I just replaced the three drones. So I kind of <laughs> they were like Franken pipes, like they were like Frankenstein, sort of just sort of old old bits and new bits. And I, each time it gets something new, another Pakistani piece would leave the set so in the end they stop being pakistani pipes and they start being eh uh, like second like i suppose i don't know second hand bag pipes are re, re you know revamped renewed so on my pipe and journey then now i was playing scottish bagpipes and um, and the weird part about it was though i was playing them using illin pipe fingering <laughs> so, <laughs> 
which kind of puzzled some pipers, especially especially in Scotland. Because I remember one day I was over there and I was busking, and there was a man and he stood listening to me for ages. And then he came over and now he complimented me, and he did say it to me. He goes, he goes, I like your style. He says, I don't know what it is. He says, I don't know what you're doing, but I like it. And I said, well, I learned on illing pipes, and I just went sort of straight over, and he goes, ah, that's it. Like so. Uh, now I had to adjust it, like you can't just go, like, you know, like the way if you play a tin whistle and then you play your bagpipe, there's a, there's a little bit of a difference and it's the same with the illin pipes, there was a bit of a difference going from the illin pipe chanter over to the bagpipe chanter. It wasn't a huge difference but there was a bit of adjusting I had to do for to get certain notes to sound a certain way. And then I developed, I suppose, I don't know, my own fingering thing, so like, you know, is that wrong? I don't think, I don't like to think so. Pipes and like the the learning system that we do today, I'll talk about this later on or in another video, but um there's a very rigorous and set fingering system uh, that you're supposed to adhere to, but that's because you're in a band and that's because everyone in the pipe band has to play the exact same way. Um, which was a development which came with pipe bands and large groups of musicians all playing on the same instrument. Whereas long, long ago, before the kind of advent of pipe bands, you didn't have groups of pipers playing together. You, you probably couldn't even get two sets of pipes to play together the same way because they, they would have sounded differently, they would have been maybe a, a semitone out or one set could have been soft, another set could have been hard, whatever else. So like say in the 1600s and in the sort of up to the mid 1700s, it, it was very much an individual thing, I would argue. And same with pipe and styles and whether that be your fingers or the pace of the tune or... so. I don't feel all that bad about that. how I finger the, 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 the chanter. It isn't the exact way that a piping school would do it. Or it's not how you'd play an illin pipe either. It's somewhere in between. But I'm okay with that. You know, it's okay like with me because I don't really play in a pipe band. And even when I did, I wasn't in a competition band and we were like a beginner's kind of a band. It's kind of a dad's army kind of a setup. Um, where beginners and learners and older players who just want to be just playing tunes and not so much interested in competitions just to get out there and have a bit of fun. It wasn't all that obvious then. Like I could blend in with the other pipers, no problem. And in fact sometimes what I was doing, like it sounded like a bit of a harmony or a grace now. Um, so don't be too worried. Like unless you're, as I say, in a, in a pipe band and you want that, uniformity, that strict uniformity, by all means learn that, you know, learn a strict fi fi fingering system, but if you're more interested in solo piping, you know, or kind of casual, casual playing, and especially, yeah, especially solo, like playing on your own, and playing your own kind of things, like, you know, don't be afraid to, to maybe develop even your own style or your own fing fingering system. I think it's very natural and I think it's very ancient ancient as well. It's it's older than like marching bands are only you know they you know they're only they're only there since the eighteen hundreds, you know. Prior to the eighteen hundreds you didn't have marching bands. Not in the same sense. I know, you know, in the in the sort of late seventeen hundreds, it was kind of coming together as that you would have kind of groups of pipers, but maybe playing sets of pipes in the army that were made by the same pipe maker. But that was, you know, that you know, I wouldn't. I'd like to see some evidence before seventeen fifty that said that there were marching marching pipe bands. Like, I've yet to find it. So if you have something that proves that there was marching pipe bands prior to the mid 1700s please post it below show us it because i'd like to see it um yeah so then as i say then so then i started getting into the scottish bagpipes and playing them and say look look i'm now i'm not i'm not the best in the world i'm not the worst in the world i'm okay 
and grand. I get, I get by and I enjoy it. So, and other people seem to enjoy it as well. I've not got complaints about it, even off other like pipers who are in pipe bands. Um, in fact, I've gotten compliments more than I've got criticisms, like saying, you know, oh, look, that's a good tune there, or like, or, like you know, there's lots of, like, lots of people have said, like, you know, that they liked me style, you know, that I did sort of a different, different, you know, you know, <laughs> and I, I don't think they were just being unduly kind to me. I think, you know, that they meant it, like it's, um, so, um, yeah, I'm not all that strict, but I think if we could kind of get back to where I wanted to be, um, I was, I was always missing out on, on the Ellen pipe stuff. There was, there was just that thing about, you know, that sound of an Ellen pipe, like that. Like the Ellen pipes, like they can just squeeze your heart, they can just, you know, grab onto your heart and squeeze it and then pull the heart cords out of you. You know, squeeze them and turn them and twist them and bend them and then shove it right back into your chest. Um, and that's what an, an Ellen pipe can do. And I certainly, as a piper, I missed that. I missed, you know, even the possibility of achieving those sounds. Of, you know, of, of evoking like that kind of emotion. Uh, and just even the sort of simple convenience of the style of sort of sitting there in a chair, you know, at the kitchen table, strapping on a bellows, or even better again, the pub, you know, like the pub, whether it's sitting outside nowadays in a smoking area, uh, maybe sitting out on the wall on a sunny day that's near to the pub, you know, if they let you take the drink outside, which is often a lovely thing to do, sitting out on a wall or bring a chair out in the sunshine, sit there, strap the pipes onto you, or if you're lucky enough that they like you playing inside the pub, not all pubs will, but some will, some, some will even pay you. Just to sit there, you know, have a pint or a bottle of Guinness or whatever you're else you're drinking, like, and just, you know, red ale. Love a red ale. The odd whiskey as well. I'm not really one for spirits. Maybe a black rum. But just to have the drink there on the table, the pipes under your arms, sitting there in your comfort, playing, and you know, a few tunes for your own enjoyment and for other people's enjoyment as well. There's just nothing like that. And that soft, sweet sound of a vanilla pipe, that heartbreaking sound, like, the, you know, I missed it. Like, I missed it sorely. So, where I am now, what I'm doing now, piping wise, is I'm trying to kind of get back to that in a way. Um, so, along my journey along the way, didn't I discover Scottish small pipes? Um, and they're a good kind of a transition because to me they were kind of perfect because it's right, okay, like I can play this. The Scottish small pipes has the same fingering as as the Grey Highland bagpipe chanter. It has the same fingering. So if you can play the big bagpipes, you can play this. Like it's just a little bit of adjusting. It won't take you too long at all, you know couple of weeks and then you know you're, you're flying like you're just same fingers and then of course they've a similar sound to an illum pipe not not quite the same but you know that nice soft warm buzzy kind of fuzz um bumbling kind of sound um yeah i just thought that they were a great compromise um okay they weren't quite an illum pipe but they weren't the bagpipe either, they were kind of somewhere um, in between. So I started off playing the Scottish small pipes. Um, the first set I got was a milk blonde set. Um, and I had them for a few years and I busked with them and, you know, um, they were grand as well. Even though that they were milk blown or, or wet blown, I used plastic grades uh, in them. I was playing the set at Gibson's. Um, Gibson, they were American. I think they were like Scottish extract or Irish descent, Scottish Irish or something like that. And 
But I, I enjoyed my pipes, my Gibson pipes. I thought they were quite nice. I thought they were nice to deal with as well. Uh, the Gibsons, um, they kind of added to them as well. Like they did, they did a a, a plastic uh, chanter stock, which I I didn't like because I I generally don't like plastic. I like wood, so. I know a pipe maker here in County Wicklow who turned me some wooden stocks and um, yeah that worked fine and the the reeds uh, the they were the Gibson if you are buying them they're like they, they call them like real pipes or Kaylee pipes um, and the 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 Gibson uh, reeds were the, pl the plastic reeds as well and they weren't great they were they went great I didn't say they weren't great I said they, they went uh, great with um with, with like with, with wet pipes with blowing pipes like the moisture like obviously doesn't really affect the reeds at all now I did find though if you're playing them continuously and daily, like, because I used to a lot, like, I'd play them day after day, busking, especially with them, and I'd play them maybe for two hours at a time. The timber, the moisture did eventually affect the timber. Now, I was playing a coca bowl, I say, and, I, you know, over days of kind of continuous playing, like, hours and days of con continuous playing, uh, the, you would find changes were happening with the, you did basically, they'd get too wet, and, they'd start cutting out and the pitch would change and you'd be kind of continuously like retuning them and sometimes they just needed a rest I suppose they just needed to dry out is what it was um, yeah so uh, th th but no but they were great so I was playing them for a while and um, what I'm playing now at the moment like I've, I've, I've had sort of sets since uh, those ones have sold them and um, then I came across a combination one time of there was a fella who had a set of border pipes now I must admit I tried out border pipes but I just I don't know whether it was just a bad chanter or a bad read or a bad me that like I was the problem but I, I, I found them um, very harsh actually on the year um, because then I'd gotten used to playing Scottish small pipes, so uh, I thought I'd have a go with the border pipes, but they just, I don't know, well, they weren't as sweet. Now, I, I might, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about getting them again, another set to try out. Uh, but I just sort of found that the, you know, look, they just weren't for me, okay? I just found them a bit loud and a bit harsh and less for, less forgiving, shall we say. Um. The border pipe chanter and raid, I found it less less forgiving than the, than the small pipe one. So, but something kind of occurred to me that like I loved the drones off a border pipe because they're larger, they're longer. There's they I don't know they they look better, <laughs> like bigger, and the buzz off them is different. I'm not going to say stronger or deeper or I don't know what. It's different though. It's different. And I just thought of something and I just thought well what about if I was playing like border pipe drones so they're larger. They do sound different. I did find them louder because the the border pipe chanter is louder than the small pipe chanter so I suppose it goes with the thing that yeah they would be louder then and stronger. I suppose I should change that what I just said. Um, but I thought these drums are amazing that it's like, you know, just because I'd been playing Scottish small pipes for a few years, once I got these, the the drums kind of really stood out. So I just thought, what about if I got a small pipe chanter and I stuck it into a, a border pipe and used border pipe drones. Now I love it. I did that and yeah it worked and I really really enjoyed the sound of that um, that combination um, and then I started going back to my roots then back to Illum pipes so I was trying to like turn these pipes into an Illum pipe like so then I was kind of thinking well right what if I start going on to bell be bellows blown pipes then as opposed to milk blown pipes right so I would need to get back used to being being with a bellows, so I did that. Then I didn't like the way the 
the border chant our or sorry the border drones were going across my chest and kind of like floating there because I found that they were kind of just wobbling up and down each time uh, each time you blow into it like they'd rise up and fall down as you squeeze them so I didn't like them kind of floating across the chest because I found that you, it, with me anyway I just found I had to like kind of readjust them a lot like because of the movement that was in them and then some some lads like put the border pipe drones up on their shoulders but then I just found that the, that the drone buzz was just way too strong in your ear that it was more difficult to listen to your chanter when you had this drones buzzing in your ear the whole time so of course I just thought of well what about could we arrange these drones like Ilum pipe drones down on the bag so that you could sit there the drones would come out a little lower on the bag so I started to rest across my lap. So, yeah, in the end, I had a set of pipes uh, that I did that way, and I found them really comfortable to play. They looked almost like an Ellen pipe or an early Ellen pipe, and they, um, yeah, they didn't have to keep adjusting them because of the, because of the. Uh, they, 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 they were resting much more securely on my lap. But then even that developed on because, and this is where I think we should actually start talking about history. <laughs> I've spent the last hour and a half just talking about myself. Um, but I was interested, as you know, in the history of pipes and when I started sort of doing these combinations of like border pipe drones with a small pipe chanter the, then I even I had a set of villain pipes um, that I'd bought for cheap um, at an auction and I was experimenting with illin pipe drones with a small pipe chanter as well um, because I wanted, like, first of all, I loved the look of villain pipes and the sound of their drones, even. Never mind the sound of the chanter, I loved the sound of villain pipe drones. Um, but I wanted to be able to turn the drones on and off, like, so the on and off switch. Um, but then I couldn't kind of, I did, my Scottish, like, D chanter, I don't know, just. I wasn't just kind of happy, like just the combination just like, like wasn't, I think just like Ellen pipes are just meant to be Ellen pipes I suppose, that's what I'm, you know, I, I was kind of, they, they were real Franken pipes, God, the more I think about that, I even had, I even took out, <laughs> some of my border pipe drones fitted into the Ellen pipe drone stock, because I wanted to, like, I love drones, right? And I'm going to talk all about drones in a while and, and why they, they resonate with me, like, on a much more deeper level. Like, actually, uh, I don't know if, if science is even the word of it. It's all got to do with sound waves and patterns and, like, patterns and be beautiful, ge the geometry of sound, even. Um, but I'll talk about that in a minute. But the... I love drones, but I love a real deep, like a real deep, beefy, bass buzz, strong buzz off drones. And so, I had a, a set, the, the set of villain pipe drones, and I added border pipe drones into them, which kind of worked in a weird way like I wasn't expecting them to, to match because they're in different keys but they did so then with this mad sort of set, set of drones they looked weird because they were cobbled together from different sets of pipes but they sounded mad they sounded good like there was this sort of very strange buzz coming off them um, but then it was getting the chanter right so then I was as I say I was putting in a small pipe chanter then a practice chanter, like you can get, you know, when you're playing the Scottish bagpipes, the, you know, your practice chanter, um, you can get like brilliant practice chanters that can be played almost like instruments as their own. I saw someone on YouTube 
stick a practice chanter into a set of Scottish small pipes and it worked lovely. In fact, the practice chanter that he was playing sounded better than the, the, the small pipe chanter that he was playing. So, the, you see, like, there's the long practice chanters, which are pretty much like the same finger spacing as your normal chanter on a bagpipe. So we have a couple of long practice chanters and I'd match, I'd manage to put them in into this set of, now these are real franken pipes, like I was I'll call them my franken pipes because they were a mixture now of illin pipe drones, sm small pipe drones, border pipe drones and then I was using a small pipe chanter and then also uh, I'd replace that with a practice chanter all going on, like off the one set of pipes but <laughs> obviously <laughs> it sounded just weird like there was there was even though the drones kind of sounded all right kind of together there were certain notes that would play on the chanter that just didn't sound right with those drones certain notes cer certain notes sounded good and certain notes just sounded just weird and uh, like wrong <laughs> 